546 days is a long time. And a broken marriage is like watching your best friend die every day for 546 days. And 546 days alone with little children is long enough to tell dad that kiddies need mum even more than he needs them. And 546 miles is a lot of highway to drive away any day. But I didn't mind spending every single dollar and all the golden moments of my time driving them up to Sydney or driving me down to Melbourne just to be with them for a Christmas or an Easter or a Melbourne Cup. I don't know how often my old friend Jesus Christ goes on sick leave and leaves Jeannie Little in charge. All I know is what I wrote down on a piece of paper in my silent flat in sad Sydney. After driving alone all the way from the beautiful city of Melbourne town, one day in the springtime, a long time ago, this is what I said. Daddy pretty hopeless that I am to them. Me and Sydney, they and Melbourne. I love them, all of them, every single little one of them. Long, cold, sharp, piercing knives are twisting deeply into my feelings. Hard, cruel, mountains of stone pain are exploding in slow motion in my chest. My children, not now beside me, but inside me. You can blow my head off. You can bury me alive. You can beat me up in a pub brawl. And I'm big enough. And I'm tough enough. And I'm rough enough. But don't ever again let me hear five little voices saying Goodbye, Daddy. But uh, getting back to my reasons for wanting to break into television, it's not for any financial reason. Um, I have my own private income. Uh, my son sells the Herald. <laughs> Frank, apart from these dreadful lights, there is another problem. I've got this mate of mine who's advising me on this job, there's a compressor ship going, and they've got me in the short list. And I said, well, how do I get the job? He said, all you have to do is just be yourself. And I thought, well, now, which particular self is he talking about? Because we all have many different selves. I think you'll agree with that. Um, I've got lots of brothers and sisters, five brothers, four sisters, two or three dozen nephews and nieces. And with a mob that size, you really have to have more than one particular self. Um, like for instance, should I be the self that comes out of me when I'm, you know, giving one of my kids a little bit of a cuddle or when I'm having a fight with one of my brothers or when I'm trying to be very prim and proper with the parish priest because he's arising. So what I wanted to know, Frank, and can you help me here, which particular self should I be projecting? I mean, for instance, should it be the, you know, the, the enthusiastic self? where I'm talking about something that really intrigues me, such as in this case, uh, body language. Tonight you can have a look around and have a look at mum and have a look at dad and have a look at the kids. And if mum crosses her legs 
and then the rest of the family follow the leader, guess what? You're looking at the bus. The little lady is the big bus. Now, you may not like to believe that. She may not even know that. They may not know it. In fact, she could give the opposite impression by asking advice from her husband or asking advice from her children. But I can assure you, the body language of all of the family following the leader suggests that the little lady is the big boss. Or should I show the, you know, the television interview herself, you know, the cool, smooth character? Mm -hmm. uh, even though it might have paid my fair home, but um, I decided that it was best to move out, so I did. I ran away one Monday morning, went to a hotel and booked in there until I sorted things out. My brother ran away from home when he was 14, but um, <laughs> he came back for lunch. <laughs> so the biggest manufacturers in the country. Uh... Brent, supposing you were twins, one of you being the man you are, and the other of you being a person who came to you for an, an, for an employment, for employment within your area, and his job was, say, working in the office or, or driving a truck or whatever, and he was to work the same number of hours that you work, and he was to get overtime and sick leave and holiday pay and penalty rates, who would make the most money, you the employer or he the employee? Oh, he would certainly make uh, far more money than I would under these circumstances. I work 80 hours a week um, in various ways, um, traveling uh, away from home and so on. Um, if you started to take penalty rates on 80 hours a week, you'd probably have to pay the fellow something like uh, 160 hours a week, if not more. Mm -hmm. And just on, you know, on a very basic amount of four or five dollars an hour, you're talking about six or seven hundred dollars a week. And uh, I certainly don't, uh, don't make that. Well, Brent, on that note, I'll have to leave you. Uh, from your own lips, you have condemned yourself from getting a position on this show because I had hoped that you might be one of my employees, but it's great to see you. <laughs> Brilliant, Paula. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, John. Or do you think they'd prefer the, um, the storytelling self, which comes out of me when I'm sort of talking about the old days when I, when I first arrived in Australia? And I was having a drink in a Dublin pub uh, with these two Australian chaps, one was the Australian Minister for Immigration, a chap called uh, John Michael Harson, <laughs> and he was having a drink with his twin brother Edna Everidge, uh, one of Melbourne's leading footballers, I believe. And they told me that in Australia there were two women for every man, and that's the reason I'm out here. But uh, John Michael Harson did not mention that one of these had to be a mother-in-law. <laughs> or Frank, perhaps they might respond to the dramatic, the serious side of me, which comes out of me when I'm talking about, well, saying goodbye to my little children. All I know is what I wrote down on a piece of paper in my silent flat in sad Sydney. After driving alone all the way from the beautiful city of Melbourne town, one day in the springtime, a long time ago, this is what I said. Daddy, pretty hopeless that I am. To them. Me and Sydney. They and Melbourne. I love them. All of them. Every single little one of them. Long, cold, sharp, piercing knives are twisting deeply into my feelings. Hard, cruel, mountains of stone pain are exploding in slow motion in my chest. My children, not now beside me, but inside me. You can blow my head off. You can bury me alive. You can beat me up in a pub brawl and I'm big enough and I'm tough enough and I'm rough enough but don't ever again let me hear five little voices.
voices saying goodbye, Daddy. And then I had another go at new faces again, and I, I took on this organ grinding act. You know, the organ grinder and the music and the dancing and all that kind of thing. And uh, we didn't win any, any prizes. Uh, we didn't even win the encouragement award, but the, uh, the judges did give us some rather good advice and so forth. Uh, they also told us to have a bath. <laughs> <laughs> and we finally got a very good act going. But unfortunately, the RSPCA stepped in. They put a stop to the whole thing. Apparently, they didn't like the way the monkey was treating me. <laughs> but I'm not proud. I don't mind sleeping toe to a bed. But he did. Actually, it wasn't a he, it was a she. <laughs> uh, actually, I did hope it was a he. It's not what you might think, by the way, but it's just that camp people are much more creative. And I hoped that, you know, he might introduce something new to the act. But unfortunately, the RSPCA, they stepped in again. And I don't know if you've ever seen the organ grinding act, you know, the, the music and the dancing and the monkey. And, and it's two things. It's very, very boring and it's very, very strenuous. And uh, the RSPCA said, look, if we didn't give this up, it could have very serious consequences. Because they said, look, it's not good for a man of my age, all that dancing. <laughs> anyway, as I said, I thought that the monkey might bring something new into the act. Uh, he did. Another monkey. <laughs> but I did get a promotion. It was what you might call a lateral promotion. Sort of a, you know, a sideways shift. Um, unfortunately, the monkeys didn't suggest this move till I was dancing in front of a truck. <laughs> As you may have noticed, my timing isn't the best. But uh, honestly, I was so affronted by this that I decided to give up show business completely and go back into medicine. But unfortunately, I've never been in medicine in the first place. <laughs> so I took up as a veterinary surgeon and I performed my first vasectomy. And it was in all the medical journals. Irish man performs vasectomy a monkey and I'll tell you what she didn't like it <laughs> or they might like the tonight show self which actually was done in the daytime the strong as the woman behind him anyway and to me that's love well this is a strong I am <laughs> <laughs> I, I was late for a date one time and this girl said to me it would be a great thing if we were like amoeba or amoeba which, as you may know, is the lowest form of life. I hope she wasn't referring to me. But the amoeba is a biological um, creation which does not require sex to reproduce. It just splits in two, and all of a sudden you have two. And she's, I said, why? She said, well, because um, if you're late for the date, I can go out with myself. <laughs> <laughs> now, ha having that being said to me, I began to think, supposing you were an amoeba, you reckon you'd go out with the likes of you? No way in the world. <laughs> I'm the worst date in the world. <laughs> well, again, getting back to the amoeba, uh, we were going to interview one tonight, but he split. <laughs> <laughs> Supposing you were an amoeba and your girlfriend was late for the date and um, all of a sudden <laughs> there were two of you. Would you go out with the likes of yourself? Would you be good enough for you? <laughs> Certainly not. Certainly not. Now, why do you say that? Well, like, of course, I know myself very well, um, and uh, um, I probably know my, my motives uh, far more than, uh, than I know somebody else's <laughs> motives, I guess. Uh, you can't all think of that question, because uh, besides being fun, it's uh, also amusing. No, it's quite serious. I've often thought to myself that I would like my sons all to grow up to be like me, um, but I wouldn't want my daughters to marry one. <laughs> anyway, as I say, the, the whole movie had to be completely recast, and I played this very sexy part, and you wouldn't want to know it, but I was sued by the producer. The producer sued me because he reckons the nude love scene 
wasn't realistic enough. Now that's very strange, because I was also served by the leading lady. <laughs> because it was. <laughs> I thank God they didn't both sue me at the same time. At least she had the decency to wait for nine months. <laughs> it was a beautiful infant. Beautiful infant. Looked like Danny LaRue. With slight overtones of a monkey. And a veterinary surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently the vasectomy didn't work. <laughs> and they might like the, the jokes on me. And... <laughs> And as children, we were always playing these games called hearing confessions. You know, a very religious family, and my eldest brother, he would play the part of the priest, and we would all tell him our confessions, and now he writes for number 96. <laughs> now, when I say I'm from Ireland, to be very specific, I'm from Northern Ireland. So you could probably call me an Irishman in R&R &R leave. Because over there, you have only three choices, R&R, &R, IRA, RIP. <laughs> I used to work years ago with this Irish Protestant guy, and uh, he was Protestant and neither was I. And we worked in the medical field, and the Australian doctor was always very keen to make you feel welcome. And he would say, what part of Ireland are you from? I said, I'm a Catholic. He said, my mother was Catholic. So I had to find a way of preventing this, these lovely Australian doctors from saying the wrong thing which should embarrass my big Protestant colleague. So this was my reply. I said, look, I'm geographically from the north of Ireland, I'm religiously from the south, and politically from the border. And just in case anyone is asking for the loan of some money, I'm financially from the Jewish sector of Glasgow. <laughs> anyway, as I say, the, the whole movie had to be completely recast, and I played this very sexy part. And you wouldn't want to know it, but I was sued by the producer. The producer sued me because he reckons the nude love scene wasn't realistic enough. Now that's very strange, because I was also sued by the leading lady. <laughs> <laughs> because it was. <laughs> I thank God they didn't both sue me at the same time. At least she had the decency to wait for nine months. <laughs> or Frank, last but not lecherous. They might like that, you know, the hammy, the, the melodramatic self that, um, you know, the Mills and Boone type of character who, who's so down hammy that it sort of affects your diet. I sort of sauntered across the street to her and she wrapped her arms around me. I sort of embraced my arms around her and in beautiful Collins Crescent, outside Melbourne University, on a romantic autumn day, I said to the blue-eyed blonde, who was young enough to be my daughter, I love you. And she said to the blue-eyed man, who was old enough to be her father, I love you too, Daddy. <laughs> Thank you. Good night. And may everybody look after everybody else. How rapidly could a person fall in love? <sighs> Just by looking at someone you could call that love, I suppose. But to me, it's not love. But everyone feels differently. They think they're madly in love just by looking at someone. And they get little um, feelings, you know? Yeah. Yes, exciting yeah. feelings. Oh, he's lovely or she's lovely. But I don't believe in that. Well, I tell you what, I fell in love with a girl in 14 minutes, and I loved her for 14 years. Now, there you are. That's rabbit. And what happened? Ah, uh, we were seasonally <laughs> adjusted. Yes, you see? <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Alfred Quiz, the only show of its kind where we take a group of contestants, take them around the country, and finally leave only one who will win $20,000. We started off in Perth with 2,000 contestants, all trying to win that one big prize, $20,000.
Then we took them from Perth all around the country and finally we eliminated people along the way in as nice as possible a way till we finished up with 17 semi-finalists, all of whom are here tonight and we'll meet them later on in the show. How we got down to this small number of semi-finalists was we asked a question of the Australian championship team of karate experts and said, gentlemen, there are four of you, there is one piano, can you in fact pulverize that piano and push it through a small hole in less than 90 seconds, the gentleman said, yes, we can certainly do that, because in fact they had already done that for 82 seconds. Then we asked the remainder of the contestants, do you believe these men could do what they say they could do? Could they do it? Yes or no? And that is the question, can they do it? Ladies and gentlemen, I think we should very shortly, but before we just move that videotape, there are certain people outside who are worried about this piano being smashed, has kicked and battered around. I might say that the RSPCA has inspected the piano and we are happy to report that it has been very well treated and is ready, willing and able to get into the fight after having a hearty breakfast of orange juice, Keller's cornflakes and a tin of Mr. Sheen. They're lining up at the barrier, seconds out of the ring, get ready for a start. They're off and running, I mean, kicking, punching, bashing, dodging, thumping, garroting, pummeling, mauling, beating, walloping, trancing. They must be in-laws. I mean, all stare and love and smashing up pianos. Rogers with the ferocious blow smashes Hammerstein. Hammerstein with a gigantic punch hammers Rogers. Rogers and Hammerstein gang up in Gilbert and Sullivan. They might have to call in the police, but the policeman's luck is not a happy one. But time is flashing by, and the apparently is being smashed out of existence by these good citizens of Melbourne, engaged in harmless play. But will they do it in time? Time is running out, which is what the piano would like to do. The piano has been kicked in the groin and is now playing jingle bells. A left to the solar plexus, a left to the nose, a left to the armpit, a left to the toes, a left, another left, and another left. This might be the revival of the Australian Communist Party. And time is running out. Will this match it in 70 seconds? Will this match it in time? Time is running out. A left to the ear, a right to the jaw. You think he was hitting his mother-in-law? Spectators are screaming for blood. Why don't they go to the blood bank? A right to the head, a left to the chin. The whole damn thing is caving in. Is there enough time left? That is the question. Tis nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against the seas of trouble. I would bloody know. Roses are red, violets are blue, kicking to health harder the piano is stew. Nine seconds, do we have the time? Seven seconds, do we have the time? Five, four, I think we might do it. Three, two, no, yes we will do it. I'm mortified, I would have said yes, but the evidence says no. Now well these gentlemen are putting that piano back together again because it's the only one we have our orchestra being what it was. And they will do this in 25 seconds, but I must say this. I would now like to introduce the loveliest and the first of our semi-finalists, lovely Kathy Bryan. Hello, Kathy. Great to see you, Kathy. Yeah. After all these, I believe, 12 different contests you went through. That's right. And on every single one, you got the right answer. And you stuck to a formula, the formula being that you said no in every case. This must be great. Have you seen your sex therapist? I'm looking at the hand fixed. <laughs> Kathy, uh, the other thing, didn't you tell me that you came from British Honduras? That's right, my father was a British diplomat there. And he played in a reggae band with, in Kino. <laughs> and why did he go to this finishing school in Switzerland? And also, I believe your mother was a year as cook. That's right. <laughs> before she got a job. Yeah. Mm. And uh, I believe you engaged. Yes. Anybody you know? <laughs> <laughs> Kathy, let's head here because one of our guys has a washing machine in his hand. He's giving me signs. <laughs> Kathy, we would like to get you closer to the $20,000 because, as a matter of fact, we are philanthropists. Three questions are all you have to answer. And these three questions were given to 100 people in the public, all of whom, to a man, even the women, give us their best answers. Okay. So I have the eight best answers here where you can't see them. This is stereophonic smell of vision, but I'll have to think, but you can't see them. You have to give the best answer or the second best answer. And if you get the three right, Kathy, then you are through to the grand final next week. Great. Kathy, I can only give you three seconds for each answer. Mm -hmm. And as well, I must have that fixed too. As well as that, I must accept your first answer. Fine. 
So are you with me, Kathy? <clears throat> right. Ready okay. to go. Kathy? <laughs> and we'll have to make this sound like uh, that very dramatic show. Master Brain. <laughs> Kathy, for the first question, what is the capital of Victoria? Melbourne. Come on, give Kathy the hand that she deserves. <laughs> Kathy, the next question is a bit closer. Mm -hmm. Only one to go. After this one, if you get this one right, you're in front. Kathy, for the second question, what is the capital of Queensland? Brisbane. <laughs> I didn't even know that, now is there? <laughs> Kathy, the final question. And this is the question that will bring you right up the grand final next week. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's a more difficult question. Therefore, it will be harder to answer. But the prize is bigger. Kathy, for the final prize, what is the capital of New South Wales? Sydney. <laughs> Good idea, you know, you have shown such a tremendous amount of perspicacity and knowledge that I think I might take up reading one of these days. <laughs> Anyway, Kathy, you've won the prize. We'll see you next week. And if I might throw to a commercial, and we'll be back in about, before you can say otorhinolaryngology, which is a medical term meaning otorhinolaryngology, with Fred Mahoof. Thank you, and see you there. <laughs>